I want you to go with me to the book of 2 Samuel. And Betty made a statement about needs. She and Russell have a need, and that is that their house would sell down in Myrtle Creek and that they would find the right one to come open here in the greater Eugene area. And then Helen and I have a request. We're trying to sell our house too. We've actually found one that's probably within a mile of our existing house. And it's, it's funny, it's the same color as our house. You know, our house is gray and then it has white trim. And uh, so anyway, uh, it'd be nice to sell ours and move right over there because it's one story, it's one level, and um, that would be excellent. Yeah. Praise God. I want you to turn to Second Samuel chapter... Let's see, where do I want you to go? You don't know. You sure? Go to 2 Samuel 6. You've heard me probably say many times that the highest priority of the believer is not evangelism. And we just got through having an evangelism harvest training for like three three day, what was it Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday and Sunday five days so how many of you know I believe in evangelism I'm for evangelism I evangelize I tell people about Jesus I go on foreign soil to tell people about Jesus and with all of that and my love for the harvest I still don't believe it's the highest priority even though it is a priority my personal opinion is I believe the highest priority is worship. Yes. Amen. It's worshiping the Lord that we have been, we have been uh, challenged and equipped and anointed to worship the Lord. Right. Satan, also known as Lucifer, fell. Most theologians believe you can read this in Isaiah 14, also Ezekiel 30, uh, 28. Most theologians believe that there is uh, verbiage that's referring to Satan's fall in both those passages. I concur with that. Many of you may not know this. Many sh- maybe you do, and that's this: is that uh, Lucifer, or Satan, was actually he was one of the archangels. He was also the anointed cherub. That means his responsibility was the worship leader of heaven. I don't know if you know that or not, but he led worship in heaven. Isn't it interesting that one of the areas that the enemy wants to come in and twist and manipulate and, and work in is in the area of worship. To get it, people not to worship. And by the way, prayer is an aspect of worship, a subpart, but worship is that free aspect of glorifying Him. In the New Testament, the word that's used for worship is the word proskuneo in the Greek. Proskuneo literally means this. It means to move forward as if to kiss. And whenever I hear that word, it always reminds me of back many years ago. Maybe you guys can remember this, but there used to be a a gum commercial. I think it was Wrigley's Spearmint, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, Double Mint Gum. And there'd be a a guy and a gal running on the beach, and they'd be running towards each other. Have you seen this? And they'd run right at each other, and then finally they'd embrace, and they would kiss. And it was like double mint and, you know, the flavor, and obviously, you know, it implies you don't have stench breath and dragon breath and, you know, all those kinds of things. (laughs) There you go, that you brush your teeth and, you know, whatever. But the point was that you would come together. And proskuneo literally means that very same thing, to move forward as if to kiss. There's literally an, uh, there's a, uh, an intimacy factor associated with worship. Worship is intimacy. David, who read, wrote many of the Psalms, was a worshiper. He knew how to worship. And so I want you to take a look, if you would please, at 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse number 1. So I'm after, just like I said, after a whole five days of everything on evangelism, now I'm going to say, okay, our highest priority, although that's huge and very, very important, is to worship the Lord. Here we go. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. 
He and all his men went to Bela, that's in Judah, to bring uh, up from the ark of God, which is called by the name. Again, from there, the ark of God, which is called by the name. Do you see the name? If you have a footnote there, it'll jump down, and in your footnote, it will say this. The Hebrew Septuagint and Vulgate do not have the name, but other translations do have the name. The name is really representative of God. Now, the nation of Israel and the transcribers believed the name of God was so high and lofty that they wouldn't even pronounce the name, okay? That's how important that name was to them. They called it the name. We also know Jehovah. It goes on to say, the name of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned, note this, Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. And we all know the ark was so many cubits wide, so many, so many cubits long, so many cubits wide. And here's the distinctive factor about the ark of the covenant. It represented the presence of God. It is that which when Moses built his tabernacle sat in the Holy of Holies. It was privy only to during that time frame, the high priest and only once a year that he would go in. Okay. Or whenever he would do his sacrifices. So the rest did not have access other than in transit. How do you know we have access to the throne room of God 24-7? The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne room of God that we might, note this, find mercy and grace in our time of need. If you have a time of need, it's the time to approach the throne room of God where being released is mercy and grace. Mercy is what you don't get, you, you should get, but you don't get because of the mercy of God. The grace of God is His favor, His unmerited favor. Hallelujah. In fact, when you go to the book of Luke's gospel, chapter 4, 18 and 19, and you get down to verse 19 in the latter part of it, and it's the litany of the list of things that you and I have been called upon to do because it's what Jesus was anointed to do. And the final thing is this, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. It's also known as the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, there was a cancellation of all debts in Israel culture and history. That meant everything reverted back to its own original owners. Uh, properties and all kinds of things, it went back to them. Can I tell you something? When Jesus made that declaration, Listen, I know, I recognize right now we're in what's called the year of Jubilee and we're getting to the top of the head of the new coming year that's coming up on the Jewish calendar. I, I understand all of that. But the bottom line is this, ladies and gentlemen. The bottom line is that every day is the year of the Lord's favor. Not just a certain year, but every year and every day. Because he says that we're to preach the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. Today, look at somebody say, today is the, the day of the Lord's favor. Okay, so he's enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. And by the way, you can go out of the other passages and the Lord says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. God cannot be housed between a cherubim and a, and a sitting on an ark or anything like that. God is not just housed in us alone. God is everywhere. Now that does, I'm not getting weird and spacey there. That's good theology. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. And not only is he everywhere at once, but he is in you by the Holy Spirit. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit came up and took residence on the inside of you. Come on, somebody. He is living there right now. That's why when Jesus said, when two or three are gathered together, I am there in the midst of them in the book of Matthew. He's here, Matthew 18. He's right here in the midst of us. Praise God. I mean, we have an empty seat here, an empty seat. Who knows? He may be sitting right there. All I know, he's here and he's in here. You all know my story of John Mark when he was a little boy, four years of age. And Helen had, we'd, I don't remember if we'd come home from a church meeting or what. We were pastoring in Roseburg at that time. And we were coming home. Holly, you liked this story. You probably heard it a million times, but... It's, well, that's exaggerating. That's evangelistically speaking because I wouldn't have enough time to say it a million times. That's hyperbole to the max there, isn't it? <laughs> How about many, many times? So anyway, when John Mark, by the way, that's my daughter-in-law's husband, our son, our oldest son. When he was four, that's for the camera's sake and everybody else that may not know that. But when he was four, Helen said, John Mark, do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And he goes, Mom, I already know him. Do you want him to come into your heart? And he says, he's already in my heart. 
I've already asked him in my heart. And then she says, well, how do you know that? Because I hear him. He's on the inside of my heart and he's playing the drums. You know, the heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. That's that little bass beat, right, Dan? Boom, 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 boom. He's playing the drums. Now, he had a revelation that has sustained him to this day and age at 31 years of age that he's never forgotten. That he was born again when he was four years of age. So he's enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. Verse 3, they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill in Uzzah and Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the, the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ohio was walking in front of it and David and all Israel was celebrating. Note this word, were celebrating with all of their might before the Lord with the castanets. Do, 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 do. I didn't know they were Spanish. Anyway, they had the castanets. And they had harps and lyres and timbrels and sistrums and cymbals. By the way, when it says they were celebrating, they were dancing. Yeah. It's okay to dance. Did you know that? Yeah. I was raised in Pentecost and I was raised as a kid. You know, you don't go to dances, you don't go to movies, and you don't, you know, do any of those kinds of things. Yeah, bowling or whatever. But how you know we got freed since those days? Hallelujah. Yeah. We got freed from, yeah, thank God, right? Praise the Lord. How many of you know that does not sanctify you or make you holy? No, righteousness is because you have right standing with the Father through the Son, Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We're righteous because of Jesus, not because we wear certain clothes or don't wear certain clothes, whether we wear rings or no rings or nose rings or no nose rings or earrings or no earrings. Are, are you hearing me? That's not what makes you righteous. The shed blood of Jesus Christ and Him living on the inside of you is what makes you righteous. I say amen that we've gained some liberty in our time together. Hallelujah. So they're dancing with all of their might. Now, when I was in grade school, we used to have square dancing. And so, uh, did anybody have square dancing in grade school? It was the Western something or other and this dance and that dance or whatever. And I remember there was this gal named Belinda, and we do this dance called Bow, Bow, Belinda, and I'd end up with Belinda on Bow, Bow, Belinda. <laughs> but I, I was doing the Western roll or the Western two-step or whatever, all those crazy dances, and it wasn't because I didn't like dancing. I mean, it was because I didn't like dancing. It was because I really had a spiritual beef against it. But I said, see, we're not supposed to dance. So I got an approval. I didn't have to dance in grade school because we didn't believe in that. Well, that was bogus. I mean, come on, give me a break. My wife now, she likes me to dance. We, in fact, here's a whole sidebar. I may run out of time, but that's all right. How many of you know I always have another Wednesday night or a Sunday, right? So we were, we would... We were pastoring, and we had a group of people, and, and Rob put this together, and he said, let's, let's do this dance thing. So we went down to Staver's Dance. There was a bunch of us, and we took, we took uh, dancing. Did you, were you part of that group when we went down there? Yeah, so we went down there and Staver's Dance, and I mean, we learned to do the rumba. We learned to do the cha-cha. We learned to do the, uh, what? Tango, and I was the tango king. You know, you have to get a certain way and hold their frame just right and everything else. And so the instructor, she, she and I danced the tango together. Do you remember when we did that? All oh, right. <laughs> my wife always, yes, he had a great, great. So my wife always says, honey, we need to go back down there and dance at Staver's Dance. And, and I says, oh, I'm good. I, you know, I was, the, I, was the dan I was the tango king. That's enough. I want to live large in my own mind, you know, and that's... <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so it says that these guys were the, these were these Levite priests that were wa walking alongside of it. And they were celebrating with all their might. And it says, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached up and took hold of the ark of God. Because the oxen stumbled, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Now, I'm telling you, want to close a meeting quick? That'll do it. When somebody croaks on you, how many of you know that'll shut a meeting down like in a heartbeat? We were pastoring in Roseburg and I invited my friend, Apostle John Paulus. He lives in West Virginia and we've kept a relationship through many years and we still relate. Email, I see him at different conferences and events and things like that. But John was down 
And uh, he was preaching this week-long revival meeting for us. And I remember he would always lay hands on people at the end and pray for them because you got to do that in a revival meeting. You know, you got to lay hands on people and pray for them. And he had them all lined out and we had carpet on the altar area, a strip of carpet down the middle between the aisles and a car carpet here. So it was like the typical 250 seater church with the arches and it sat a certain way, right? So these people were being prayed for and we had hard wooden benches. Now they were nice, but uh, there was no padding on them. And there was people lined up and they were getting prayed. The power of God was there. People were going out under the power and the fire of God was falling. How many of you know you don't want to fake it? If it ain't God, just stand up. This lady who wasn't even being prayed for went down. And when she did, the back of her head hit that wooden pew. It cracked her head open and blood was going everywhere. It was on the floor. And we picked her up, and how many of you know we are wise as serpents, harmless as doves? And we said, we believe in divine healing, so everybody knows. We're all into laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. We're all for that. But when you got a pretty good-sized gash, and you're bleeding all over the floor, and we said, you need to go to the hospital. Our insurance will take care of this. Please go. She's just a woman of faith and power. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to tough it out, whatever. She finally did go and eventually got stitches and all that. But how many of you know that shut that meeting down that night? I mean, the power of God was there, but whoo, all of a sudden, once everybody saw that, it was like, ah, panic, fear, everything. What a way to shut it down. So my, my thing is this, if it's God, good, fall, you aren't going to get hurt. But if it ain't God, don't do a courtesy drop for anybody. Just thought I'd tell you that. Now, remember, these guys had been away from... The Ark of the Covenant was lost by Saul and his sons were killed. They stole it. Remember that the Philistines took it? Uh, not that long. No. Because David just had come into power and he's already restoring worship. So what happened is it went down to the Philistines and they decided, well, what are we going to do? Let's take it into our God, Dagon, the fish God. If you remember the story, when they put it in with Dagon, the fish God of the Philistines, that God fell over. Boom. How many of those power? Okay, they said, that's not going to work. We better do something else. Took him back in. This time he fell over and the arms fell off of him. <laughs> and, and then pretty soon they were having hemorrhoids. You know, you ever heard of roids? Hemorrhoids. These were these, they called them tumors, but they were really hemorrhoids. That is what broke out on the people. It was very uncomfortable, by the way. They did all their worshiping st standing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sidebar. Thanks, David. I do this often in a men's meeting, don't I? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So anyway, then they decided, well, we're going to get rid of this thing. All we're having is problems. Let's ship it out of here. And so they put it on a new cart. They put a, a heifer who had just had a, who had a calf. And it says that it went off to Lodi Bar and it was lowing all the way. Moo, moo. And the calf was following along, I'm sure, making noise as well. And it went to Lodi Bar, and then it ended up at uh, this place where we came out into the story earlier. And then we see they're taking it up to the mount where they're going to worship the Lord. And that's called Mount Zion. And as they're on their way up the mountain, what ends up happening is this guy touches it. Now, he should have known better. He should have been read up in the Word. Have you know, we need to study ourselves under, uh, uh, study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Why is that? So that you do the right thing. He didn't do the right thing. And that was this. They put that Ark of the Covenant on a cart just like the Philistines had done when they should have known that it was the responsibility of the Levites and the priests. It was the priests, actually, their responsibility to put staves to the sides. And there was two in front and two behind, and they carried that Ark on the shoulders of the priest. Can I tell you something, saints? You and I are priests of a new covenant. It is not limited to a hierarchy of just simply pastors or leaders in the body of Christ. I want you to know with assurance, every one of you, the moment that you said yes to Jesus Christ, you became a priest of the Most High God. The Bible says in the book of Peter, 1 Peter, it says this, chapter 2, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people declaring the praises of God. 
Your job assignment is to praise Him. It's to worship Him. And by the way, that's both in deed and in word. It's an act of worship. Can I tell you what? Your work is worship. Did you know that? Whatever you're doing, I, I never want to minimize anything anybody does. Because it is your assignment. Whatever you do, value and esteem it. Because the Bible says whatever we do in thought, word, or deed, do it all as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So your work is an act of worship. Your praise is an act of worship. So what happened is he reached up to stabilize that ark. And when it shook, it, the power of God hit him and he went down dead. How you know you can't mess around with the things of God? Okay, there is still a holy, awesome, reverential fear that we need for God, our Creator. Now, I'm into Papa, and I'm into Father, and I'm into all of that. But at the end of the day, He still is a reverential, holy God. Are you hearing me, saints? He's not your best buddy. Well, Jesus, I, I, I don't want to go down that road. Let's just go on. I always tell parents this. I say, parents, listen, when your kids are growing up and you're training them and raising them, they're not your best buddy. They're your kid. Your role and responsibility, according to the book of Ephesians 6, 4, is to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's your job. It says, parents, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the nurture or in the training and the instruction of the Lord, whatever your version is. They're not to be your best buddy. Now, there may come a day they'll be friends of yours once they're out of your house and they're on their own and they're established. But when they're in your household, they're your children. You have a response, a parental responsibility to raise them in the things of God. To forfeit that and subject that simply to the church is a misnomer. It is not just Ms. Holly and John Mark's job or Dave's or whoever, or Wilma's or whoever is in there. Uh, whoever is working in yours, Joseph, whenever you're in there, it's not their job. To, their job is to assist you. Have you know, we get them two times a week, maybe. Most it's only once. Okay? Are you hearing me? You've got them every day of the week. All right. So he went down. He died. The meeting was shut down. Whoo! Verse 8, then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. And if you want to know what that is, you go down to the footnote and it says this, E-F-G. Perez Uzzah means outbreak against Uzzah. That's what it means. Outbreak against Uzzah. And so David's angry. Now, how do you know it's okay to be angry? You ever hear people say, well, you should never get angry. You're denying an emotion that God gave you. I mean, even God got angry and gets angry. That's what the Bible says. Be angry and sin not. It's how you process and deal with the anger. To deny it is wrong. Now, we've all heard the term, somebody went postal, right? You ever heard that term, postal? And then they take it out on other people. Here's what happens. They often have so stuffed their anger that they've never vented it properly or correctly. They've never had the tools to do that. How do you know, in any relationship, you will have disagreements. You have to work through those. You have to get through the disagreements. And there may even be angry that you have to overcome, anger that you have to overcome. But when you do, you overcome that and you work through that situation. All right. So, how many of you have ever gotten loud at your mate, husband or wife? If you're a man, that means a woman. If you're a woman, that means you're man, a man. You ever, been, you, you ever got loud at somebody? You, you, as long as you're talking, you know I'm for it because you got to talk stuff out. I just want to, I want to be a real pastor who talks, to, tells you real truth because we act like everybody's just going to be perfect and never going to have conflict or issues. Yeah, you're humans and God is working in you to have the right response. And sometimes you may ramp it up in the volume level till you get the right response. But you're still talking. You're not not talking. All right, let's go on. So it says, David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David, which is on Mount Zion. Okay. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, Obed the Gittite. wasn't even Israelite, he was a Gittite. 
Okay, and that's important because if you remember later on, there was also a Gittite who was the husband of Bathsheba that David does in. I don't know if you knew that or not. He was also a Gittite. Uriah the Hittite was a Gittite. Yeah, Uriah the Gittite. He was a Gittite. I'm trying to rhyme. That's not even working for me. So it says, The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom of the Gittite for three months. Listen to this. And the Lord blessed him in his entire household. Why? His presence was there. Write down Psalms 22, 3. The Lord inhabits the praises. It says of Israel, but it's also his people. We're his covenant people. The Lord inhabits his praises. You know, you don't have to be in the church congregation to praise the Lord. You can worship him when you're going 55 or 60 or 65 or 70 down the freeway. I'm not sure. Do the angels stay with you at 70? Anyways. They do. I, dr I drive that fast sometimes. All right. <laughs> but the presence of the Lord. It can happen in the shower when you're worshiping the Lord there. It can happen on a mountaintop experience. Now listen, I am not an advocate that just says, well, we're just going to worship the Lord in the mountains. We're going to worship the Lord at the lake. That's an add-on. Of course you can. You can worship the Lord anywhere. That does not substitute coming together in corporate assembly and worshiping. See, some people, because they've been wounded by the church, and let me just tell you, anybody could be wounded by the church, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. Look at somebody and say, get over it. Look at somebody else and say, you're bigger than that. Here's the reason why. The greater one lives on the inside of you to help you overcome slights and injustices and hurts. That's exactly what the enemy wants to have happen. He wants you to pick up an offense because you got hurt. Somebody said something. Somebody did something. Somebody didn't look at you the right way. Somebody didn't smile at you that day. Somebody didn't say, good morning, how are you? Now, we, can, we make it a point to have at least three or four meaningful contacts where people shake hands within our church body. We do that on purpose. We want that to happen. We want you to know we are friendly. We do love you. And we care about you. But maybe you missed it that day. Don't let it be a deterrent to what God wants to do in your life. So he took that, that, that ark there and it says, The blessing of the Lord came to him. Now just let's try to put this into perspective. If the presence of God which was there at Obed-Edom's house. And I believe the manifest presence of God because we already know He's with us always. But because of our worship and our gratitude and the attitude of gratitude, that it would just engender God's presence, which once again brings His blessing, which is also His favor. Going on. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the house of, household of Obed-Edom and everything he has. Woo, I like that. Everything. I'll take some of that. How about you? I'll take some of that. Blessing on everything. Blessing on his health. Blessing on his personal relationship with God the Father. Blessing on relationships with fin, uh, f family and friends and extended people and family members. The blessing of the Lord is there. And it says then, so David went to the, to the house of Obed-Edom, to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord, note this, they had changed it. Because why do we know this? They had taken six steps. He sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. If you know why, when I get up here and we've been praising in the worship and I get excited and I shout and I say, let's shout unto God with the voice of triumph. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, Psalms uh, I think it's 47.1, clap your hands all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. When, when um, Hamilton was here, he was absolutely right. He says, you know what, when you go to the game and when you were at the game on Saturday at the Ducks game, I bet you that you were standing at some point in time, you were watching on television, whatever vehicle, listening on the radio, when they made a touchdown and they made a first down, there was some level. If you have any life or blood in you, you were shouting, you were rejoicing. 
If he can do that for that, how much more can we do that for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? If I get to preach again next week, I'll bring that up. <laughs>